Greetings, my fellow Fimbo Seven Thinkers of the Three's News Podcast. My name is Craig. I'm transmitting from the beautiful, swampy mangroves of South Florida. And today's date, Tuesday, April 18th, 2017. Yeah. The slave tax day deadline, unless you file an extension. It's just funny when people out there, all those peasants, went to the president. Show us your taxes because we got to do that. Shoot. I could really get two craps if you show us my his taxes or not. That's not important. Integrity. Yes, I want integrity even though I'm a peasant to the fascist extinct. Yeah, so um, just a little bit mellowed out, a little tired. Not a little disappointing moment, but nothing to rant over. Yeah, I am, am podcasting at Squiggy's Pizza, located 207 Southwest 2nd Street, in the heart of the Hamarshi District of Fort Lauderdale, Florida. You can do a pickup. At 954-522-6655. Once again, 954-522-6655. And nope, they're not going to deliver your pizza halfway across the planet. Okay, so <laughs> but if you're in the Fort Lauderdale area, check it out and let them know that Loki Left the Third has sent you. So I'm not going to go on my little rant. But, um... I just like when it's the same old song and dance. So, no, I'm not going to be ranting on these areas. So, instead, let's just kick it off. Which came from freethoughtproject.com. That's what's entitled Army General and former VP of Company at the Heart of Child Sex Trafficking Scandal Arrested for Child Rape. This is by Jay Thurma. Sirmo Polos. What, and it says here, retired Army General who, after leaving the military, worked as a VP for, for Embattled Diner Corp International for three years. The private military contractor at the heart of numerous international sex child sex scandals had been charged with multiple counts of rape for alleged assault of at least one minor three decades ago. Major General James Grazopoline facing six charges for alleged rapes that happened in 1983 and 1989. According to an announcement made by the Army last Friday, he faces life and prison and the loss of his pension if convicted on the charges. Life in prison and thus loss of his pension and convicted of the charges. As a retired officer, Grazopoline is a so is subject to military law under the Uniform Code of Military Justice, UCMJ, and will face an Article 32 hearing to determine if he will face a court martial. Details surrounding the case remain scarce as the Army released no other information as what to precip- precipitate Grazio Plain being charged three decades after the alleged sexual assault. According to the New York Daily News, Grizzly Blaine from Virginia graduated from the U.S. Military Academy in West Point, New York, and entered in the Army in 1972 as an armor officer. Before retiring in 2005, he worked as a director of force development in the Pentagon's Joint War Fighting Capabilities Assessment. Grizzly Blaine's light LinkedIn page says after leaving the military, he has worked with the military contractors, Dean Corp. International and Mission Readiness LLC. While potentially just a coincidence, Grizzo Plain's connection with Dino Corps immediately raised a red flag as the company has seen embroiled in the numerous high level scandals involving the exploitation and trafficking of children for sex, dating back as far dating as far back as the Bosnia conflict during Bill Clinton's tenure as US president. Revealing an extreme level of complicity of Dean Corp, Dean Corp in the illegal exploitation of children, former employee Ben Johnson filed a RICO lawsuit against Dean Corp after he was allegedly fired for reporting human rights abuses. 
by other employees during the Bosnian conflict. In 2002 report titled Dying, Dying Corp Disgrace, Johnson was quoted. None of the girls were from Bosnia. They were imported by Dying Corp and the Serbian Mafia. These guys would have say, I gotta go to Serbia this weekend, top pick up three girls. Dying Corps leadership was 100% in bed with the Mafia over there. A report from Salon. Salon further details the systematic abuse Johnson alleged to have witnessed. Johnson recoiled in horror when he heard one of his fellow helicopter mechanics at a U.S. Army base near Tulsa, Bosnia, bragged one day in early 2000. My girls, not a day over 12, they're bragging about a 12-year-old sex slave pushed Johnson over the edge. I had to do something, he said. There were kids involved. At least 13 Dying Corps employees have been sent home from Bosnia for purchasing women or participating in other prostitution-related activities. But despite larger amounts of evidence in some cases, None of the Dying Corps employees sent home have faced criminal prosecution. Denoting widespread knowledge of the sexual exploitation of children engaged in by Dying Corp within the halls of government, Georgia Congresswoman Cynthia McKinney, during a hearing on the proposed 2006 Department of Defense budget, asked then Defense Secretary, Secretary, of, Defense, Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld, Mr. Secretary, is it a policy of the U.S. government to work companies that traffic in women and little girls? That's my first question. Since that time, it appears Dying Corps was still enjoying the lucrative privilege of doing business with the U.S. government at the taxpayer's expense. Has failed to reform itself to regulate the sexual exploits of its employees or children, according to numerous emails released by WikiLeaks between Sharon Mills and then Secretary of State Hillary Clinton. And I will go on here. An email from Mills to Clinton warned of a potential Washington Post article which would describe the event where Dying Corps employees hired a 15-year-old boy to mock lap dances that involved Dying Corps employees putting dollar bills in the boy's waistband just as a stripper would a stripper's garter. Additional WikiLeaks cables described as the event as purchasing a service from a child, while denoting specific strategies to convince journalists not to cover the story. This ingeniously, genuinely claiming that it would risk lives. All risk lives. Okay, so. What the hell, yeah? Although the email between Mills and Clinton claimed no sex took place, the tradition of Bak Baka Bays in Afghanistan often involves rape and young boys being sold to the highest bidder. The most disturbing thing is that what happens after the parties, often the boys are taken to hotels and sexually abused. There are many people who support this tradition across Afghanistan, and many of them are very influential, according to a BBC report. In spite of all these nefarious activities, Dying Corps continues to be rewarded with U.S. government contracts. In December of 2016, the U.S. Navy signed a $94 million contract with Dying Corps to facilitate humanitarian aid, civic assistance, minor military construction, and contingency programs to support exercises and other initiatives. This brings us back to the question asked of Rumsfeld by former Congresswoman Cynthia McKinney. Please share the story to help expose the sickening, sickening corruption. As no company that allows the ex willful exploitation of children should be ever be awarded a contract by the U.S. government. Damn straight. How come these filthy scumbags using taxpayers' money to do what the hell they want? They ain't special. They're pieces of garbage. And I know Major General James Garazoblin is still presumed innocent until proven guilty. 
But there are other cases like that. According to if you go to star if you go to starsandstripes.com. They have one about some ROTC incident that happened in Iowa. On sex scandals and so forth. There's the kind of people you want to have your money go to that play this tyrannical propaganda and in some some of them you could be on your own children, God forbid. Yeah. Very confoundedly blasphemous. I think as far as I'm concerned, they should just start putting exempt letter exempt um exemption exempt on their uh, W two forms and give the and give the and give the internal revenue revenue service the big middle finger. Go, I'm not gonna have my see my money go to this these scumbag organizations that they wanna that are in these particular entities with our tax dollars. And everyone that's involved in this and, and is found guilty to the judicial due process, you're gonna they, they may just have to put you in isolation because there's a lot of people out there will take you out. Guarantee you that. You will have lots of problems in the general public. So as far as I'm concerned, we just gotta, you know, keep going here and um but like I said, make sure justice prevails honorably. Yes, he does deserve a fair trial, court martial. That was all done in good faith, and they have to have some merit. But this is just an example of what the hell is really going on with these particular facilities at the American money, imperialism, all that garbage. How did they piss on the empire? How does the damn thing crumble for all I care? So. All right, enough of that. I'll be ranting on this all day. All right. So the next one here came from The Verge. And it says here, it says here, facial recognition is coming to U.S. airports. Fast-tracked by Trump. It's by Russell Brandom. As it reads here, soon it may be, be hard for visa holders to board an international flight without submitting to a facial ge- geometry scan. The TSA began testing facial recognition systems at Dole's Airport. Oh, excuse me, 2015, then expanded to this test to JF, New York's JF, JFK Airport last year. Fast reading check in kiosks will be appearing at Ottawa National Airport this spring, and British Airways are rolling out a similar system at London's Heathrow Airport. Compare face, comparing faces capturing at security screens with a separate capture at the boarding gate. Now a new project is poised to bring to those same systems at every national airport in America called Biometric Exit. The project will face will use facial matching systems to identify every visa holder as they leave the country. Passengers will have their photos taken immediately before boarding to be matched with the passport style photos provided with the visa application. There is no match in the system. It could be evidence that the visitor entered the country illegally. The system is currently being tested on a single flight from Atlanta to Tokyo, but after being expedited by the Trump administration, it's expected to expand to more airports this summer, eventually rolling out to every international flight and border crossing in the U.S., Woo! Yes, I'm a patriot. I worship Donald Trump, but this is okay. The tyrannical way, baby. U.S. Customs and Border Protection's Larry Panetta, who took over the airport portion of the project in February, explained the advantage of the facial recognition at the Border Security Expo last week. Facial recognition is a path forward. We're working on Panetta, as it said at the conference. We are currently have everyone's photos, so we don't need to any sort of enrollment. We have access to the Department of State's records, so we have photos of U.S. citizens. We have visa photos. We have a photo. We have photos of people when they cross into the U.S. and their biometrics are captured into DHS biometric database. Ident. Some of the form of biometric exit has been discussed for decades. 
but it's only recently that facial recognition emerged as a method of choice. Customs and Border Protection agents currently take photographs and fingerprints from every visa holder entering the country, but there are no similar measures to verify someone has left the country before their visa expires. Homeland Security estimates that roughly half a million visitors to the U.S. overstay their visas each year, but without a verifiable exit, exit process. The government has no way to determine how many visitors are actually overstaying or who they are. Facial recognition is easy because everyone knows how to take a photo. Biometric exit will close that loop, giving CPB agents verifiable biometric proof that a given U.S. visitor has left the country. The most recent proposal was set in motion by former DESH chief Jay Johnson was planned for Rella by the beginning of 2018, but President Trump has sped up that process, making the program central part of his aggressive border security policy, the President's executive immigration order on January 27th. Trains coming by. Best known for suspending all visitors to the U.S. from seven majority Muslim countries, also included a clause expediting biometric exit with three progress reports to be made over the next year. A revised order in March contained the same language, and while both orders have been stayed by federal court, the biometric exit system remains one of the new administration's top priority of CBP. As recently as February, CBP was still weighing four different methods of biometric exit, including fingerprint and iris-based systems. But as the tests have wound up, facial recognition has become clear favorite with CB within CBP. Unlike iris prints, CBP already has visa holders' faces on file, and unlike fingerprints, faces are easy to check at the gate. Facial recognition is easy because everyone knows how to take a photo. And I said here, Panetta told conferences, fingerprints. Sometimes you have to educate people how to submit their fingerprints to the machine. Making that system work will mean building a robust system for checking passengers' faces against outside data set sets. But as that system is shared with more agencies, it may be used for far more than simply verifying departures without serious implications for anyone setting foot in at an airport. Speaking at the conference, Panetta said the same technology could be shared with land borders as well as partners in the TSA and even private airlines. The act of flying could be, could be cause for law enforcement search. We are essentially building an IT backbone, which can allow TSA or potentially air carriers or any other partner to tie into our backbone, Panetta said. So once we completely build our exit infrastructure, we could potentially offer it to the TSA if they want to use our facial matching or security screening test. Or maybe if an airline wants to use facial matching to access to their lounge. So we're trying to collaborate with our various gate stakeholders and our sister agencies such as TSA. And we'll make that available to them when we have it. The TSA has been playing with fake recognition systems at check-in for years. Typically taking a photo of each passenger when they collect their boarding pass. And using the photo to track them on less intrusive cameras as they move through the airport. A company called Vision Box has already implemented a system in Aruba and also involved as a TSA pilot at JFK. There were still technical challenges, and it's clear how well the system works with existing air and airport surveillance systems, but sharing the backing backend with CBP could make the system much more efficient, giving the agency's enormous database of passport and visa photos. Those systems also raise serious civil rights questions that agencies still haven't answered. Under the FBI, facial recognition has become a powerful and controversial tool for tracking criminals. If that tool extends to face photos taken at airports, it could mean be a subtle but profound change in law enforcement powers at the airport. Right now, other than the no-fly list, you don't have a law enforcement check on who can fly, says Alvaro Bedoya, 
who studies visual recognition at Georgetown Law Center on privacy and technology. But once you take the high-quality photograph, why not run it against the database? Why not run it against state databases of people with outstanding warrants? Suddenly, you're moving from this world in which you're just verifying through identity to another world while where the act of flying is caused for a law enforcement search. DHS needs to think long and hard about bias in these systems. Absolutely. Okay, here's one moment. So far, CBP hasn't said anything about integrating the FBI into the new face scanning system, but if the TSA and airlines are able to make queries, it may be difficult to keep the FBI out. Current CBP systems retain any images flagged for inspection. Building a significant database of faces for anyone who wants to scan them. At the same time, the FBI already all right, I don't, has access to passport and visa photos that the State Department has conducted more than 50,000 scans over those photos since 2011. Reached by The Verge, a Customs Border Protection spokesperson emphasizes that the project would benefit travelers while fulfilling the congressional mandate for a biometric exit, which dates back to 1996. CBP is committed to developing a system that provides biometric exit data on non-U.S. citizens in a way to disrupt air, sea, doesn't, that doesn't direct disrupt air, sea, or land port operations. The spokesperson said CBP remains committed to protecting the privacy of all travelers. <laughs> oh, yes. I could have a wet dream on that one, right? Facial recognition critics has also raised concerns over racial bias. American recognition systems are typically trained on data sets of mostly white subjects, which lead to high error rates when scanning other races. An FBI study in 2012 found that three popular U.S. algorithms were 5 to 10% less accurate scanning African Americans' faces with similar declines for women and younger subjects. If that bias isn't corrected, it could present a serious civil rights problem, particularly since visa holders tend to be younger and less white than the U.S. population at large. Questions like these are particularly urgent as the program grows, racing to beat Donald Trump's, President Trump's mandate 100 day check in period. Currently, in one place for a single flight in Atlanta, the biometric exit system is expected to expand other airports in a matter of months. DHS needs to think long and hard about the about bias in these systems before it starts deploying them on a massive scale, says Beto Bedoya. Yes. So all you cockroaches out there that manifest on this, you want to make the world of THX 1138. That was one of George Lucas' films that came out in 1974. Oh, yeah, man. We should all go, God bless the police state. Mussolini would be proud. We should all put our hands in our hearts, go, I will sell my ass in the name of security because I'm a ethical bend over Bob to the new world order. How accurate these facial recognition can be? <laughs> I'll tell you one thing. It's going to have a lot of issues, and I expect a big amount of blowback. And you can point it at the Trump administration for help accelerating it. Don't blame them completely, but go, you're the patsy you chose poorly. Ha, 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 ha. Even neocons, you, you point the finger at them as well, and all those other douchebags in, in the bureaucratic governmental perspective. It's going to be very dangerous, my friend. It's going to put more delays in the airports. And it can backfire. It, it, it jeopardize the open free market into more of neo-mercantilism. Hip, hip, hooray. Yeah, something like, like something like Governor Rick Scott will rub his nipple and go, oh, yeah, I like this stuff. Private, private, public, private, in, in joint ventures. That's called getting work done. That's the case. I, I recommend everyone not, recommend us don't even go to the airports. Remember, they need us when we need them. Without us, they're nothing. I'm just wondering if Donald Trump's a 
posterior can fit that screen, facial screen, right? Yeah, think about that. Okay, well, this one here is going to be final. I'm doing a pretty short episode. I got, you know, just a little bit tired. But um, this came out by, um, what's this website called? Hold on here. I think it's um, Federation of American Scientists, which is FSA.org. And um, this is um, by Stephen Aftergood. And this one's entitled History of Iran Covert Action De- Deferred Indefinitely. And as it reads here, declassified U.S. government documentary history of the mo- momentous 1953 coup in Iran, in which the Central Intelligence Agency's personnel participate have been object of widespread demand for historians and other decades, and others for decades in recent years, finally seem to be on the verge of publication. But now its release has been postponed indefinitely. Why? Last year, the Department of State did not permit publication of the long-delayed Iran retrospective volume because it judged the political environment too sensitive, according to a new annual report from the State Department Historical Advisory Committee, HSC. The HSC was severely disappointed. So why I was so too sensitive about it? Because more uh, more of imperialism would be exposed? The HSC was unsuccessful in its efforts to meet with then Secretary Kerry to discuss the volume. And now there is no timetable for its release, the new report it stated. Well, we all know... Senator Kerry is a member of the CFR, the Council for Foreign Relations, so he is considered to be a bend over Bob to the New World Order. Yes, and I will proceed. The controversy originally arose in 1989 when the State Department published its official history of the U.S. foreign relations with Iran that somehow made no mention of the 1953 covert action against the Mossadegh government triggering protest and ridicule. The lapse led an enactment of 1992 statute requiring the Foreign Relations of the United States series to present a thorough, accurate, and reliable documentary history of U.S. foreign policy. The State Department has also agreed to prepare a supplemental retrospective volume to Iran to correct the record. The retrospective volume is now is what now appears to be out of reach. A truth, fair amount of documentation related to the events of 1953 in Iran have been declassified and, and, is, and released. It is unclear how much more significance remains to be disclosed. Those who have read the missing volume said there is at least new substance to it. But to position the position taken by the Obama State Department that 60-year-old policy documents are too politically sensitive to be released is disheartening in any case. Instead of disrupting relations with Iran, which already fraught an honest official U.S. account of events in 1953, might actually have, have elicited a constructive response. But that argument advanced by the Historical Advisory Committee and its chairman, Professor Richard H. Armerman, did not get the serious consideration it deserves. More broadly, the new annual report of the HAC did identify a few bright spots. One volume of the Foreign Relations series this, that was released last year met the statutory deadline for publication within 30 years of the event it described. That hasn't happened for two decades. Overall, however, the declassification environment is discouraging the HAC report found. Because the thing actually is entitled Operation Ajax, all right? And um, I think the CIA did something on that, you know, CIA Operation Ajax. And how they got involved on the overthrow of Prime Minister Mohammed Meloshidek. And they put in the Shah of Iran because they were very disturbed about him for supporting nationalizing of um, of oil. There's plenty of stuff, sites on here, so you can really look at this on your own. 
And um, let me just look this up right here. It's the CIA Library. The Study Center Intelligence Publication Studies. American Code of Middle East Terror. Hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. Tech Chats Preserve. Yeah, I want to add that. I want to definitely add that add it to the memo here. It's for CIA itself, believe it or not. The CIA Library. You'd be surprised, man, what you could find in there. And I'm going to add one more memo on here as well. I'm just going to do a little searching while I do this. I'm like, yeah, I should have done this a while back. Well, what the heck. And, um... I don't think it'll be, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll definitely add to all the shots. And, um, is there like a, okay, never mind there. Try to see if, I'm going to put a, see if I can find any videos on this one. But definitely, like, people have the right to know what really happened. And I know the National Security Archives did one as well on Operation Ajax. But, yeah, there's plenty. Let's type it in here. You'll, you'll find Oh, no, that's the official trailer. Yeah, okay, there's plenty of information on here. So, you can just look up Operation Ajax, and yeah, you'd be surprised on here. You know what? I'll add one more. This is by uh, Global Research. So you guys can really look at it and make your own judgment. This one came out. 19th of August of 2010. So, um, uh, and of course, even uh, Infowars did one too, Terror Storm, Alex Jones. And like I said, like them or not, the, the information has a lot of merit too. So I'm going to add these two there. You can read these yourselves. All right, folks? And that is all. I thank everyone for listening. Plus, uh, feel free to download and share us on your social media networks. If you've got any questions, comments, or you're something that's interesting that you may want to check out, whatever you do. Please address your correspondence with decorum. You hear music in the background. That's okay. You hit me. You can hit me on Facebook, Twitter, Google Plus, Spreaker, iHeartRadio, Tumblr, YouTube, Freedoms Network, Scene or Minds.com. Or if you email me at LookingLuck3, or you look looking number three at gmail.com, or you can actually hit me on the encrypted fans, LookingLuck03 at protonmail.com. And um, one other thing, too, I will hope have my Patreon account up there, too, if you want to donate money. Patreon.com slash Loki Luck for three eyes. Yeah, I know the keeping tabs, too, on Alex Jones, the custody case, is going to be tomorrow, according to MyStatesman.com. So we'll just try to see. I'll see I'll try to keep tabs, and I hope you guys pay attention as well. And I even pray for the Bundies on their trial in Vegas. There's a lot more foul play. So um, that is all. Once again, take a free time, but always remember that humanity acts resistance is healthy for the soul and can live in humanity. Until next time, take care of yourselves. Keep on spreading the love, and may your guardian spirits be with you.